Welcome back. My name is Matthew Barber, and today I'm going to be talking to you about um, uh, we're going to be doing a series of two presentations over the course of January, which are primarily going to look at the early modern era is usually looked at as the time period from about 1500 to 1700 AD. Um, in, in military historic historical terms, it's known as the, the time period or era of uh, pike and shot. Um, Okay, so the, the talk today is, is really a look at uh, military history in the early modern era, and primarily the focus will be on Spain. Uh, for those who study military history, now I am not a military historian, I'm an archaeologist, but um, certainly this is a topic that intrigues many archaeologists dealing with the colonial period. Uh, the time period is the period in which Spain was ascendant as a military power throughout the world. And one of the questions many archaeologists, historical archaeologists, and historians working in, in the early modern era will hear is, is things like uh, basic explanations you'll hear on the History Channel is Spain was able to conquer the Aztecs because the Aztecs were technologically inferior. Or, or, or Spain was a colonial enterprise because of this or because of that. And, and it's important to realize that as you're looking at the global scale of Spain's military efforts, they beat everyone. They beat absolutely everyone. It didn't matter if you were French or if you were an Aztec or whether you were an Incan or whether you were a Filipino. They beat all of these cultures. And it wasn't necessarily because they had technological superiority but their military was beyond what any other nation in the world was doing at the point when they came so it's technological but it's also um, it, as far as their military traditions their military culture and the way that goes and so what i'm going to try to do today is talk to you about 200 years in which the spanish army was the most powerful army in the world but to do that we're going to have to start with 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 with, with, with some other political players and we'll look at the evolution through time. So first of all, as I, I mentioned, um, we can see Spain's army here in this uh, beautiful recreation with the Burgundy Cross. Um, the era of pike and shot is probably best known for the fact that large amounts of pikemen uh, gathered for battle. But we're going to be looking at how this era transformed uh, the militaries of Europe during this time period. So I'm going to talk primarily about armies in Europe. And then next time we're going to come back and we're going to do a second lecture on the gunpowder of empires of Islam. And we're going to talk primarily about how gunpowder impacted um, Islamic armies as well. Um, okay. So starting with the French. So if we, we look at the end of the middle ages and it, it depends really where you're looking as far as how this that this comes about. But if, if we're to look at the Middle Ages in a broad sense, especially in Western Europe, at the end of the Middle Ages, France was the most powerful nation or kingdom or state, whatever you want to call it. Using the word nation is probably not correct. These are before nations uh, were really built. It was a kingdom, um, but it, it was a kingdom with a very large and very professional army. It was not feudal. Feudalism had died out. And the armies you see during the, the later half of the Hundred Years' War against England and the Burgundian Wars and even the First Italian War was a very professional army. And they pretty much had two important types of units they had, uh, one of which was the um, their heavy cavalry, which were made up of lances. Um, lances usually consisted of a, a gendy arm, a man-at-arms. Uh, plus his squire, plus maybe a servant, and a couple crossbowmen or gunners. Um, and and, and they, their other more powerful unit was um, pikemen. Pikemen were very, very important to the, um, um, to the, the, the French battle array. So pretty much anything cavalry couldn't smash, the pikemen would smash it for them. And this is what was going on at the turn of the 16th century. So in, in 1500, France was at its best and had so for about 100 years. And a good example of that is the Battle of Seminara, which was fought in 1495. The, the battle, um, which was pitted in the First Italian War, was, uh, saw the French uh, performing a victory over the nations of Spain and Naples in, in, in what is now today Southern Italy. 
And unfortunately, what happened is Spain uh, came to its ally Naples defense against a French invasion. They lined up their armies and the Spanish army, uh, which which was just about the same size as the French army, lined up and they 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 started to 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 fight the French, and things looked good. They were throwing um, javelins at them, shooting their crossbows, and the French just continued to advance. So the French came under heavy fire, but the French did not falter, and their pikemen and their heavy cavalry just pushed right through the just went right through the Spanish battle lines. And it, 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 it almost, almost killed the king of Naples in the battle. Spain and Naples were humiliated in their defeat. Um, they just lost so badly. It, it was, it was a horrific um, loss. And the French thought, well, God, they are definitely still the most preeminent power in the world. Nobody can touch them. Nobody can contest them. If they want to take Italy, that's all on them. One of the people overseeing this battle for Spain at the time was a guy by the name of Gonzalo Fernandez de Cordoba. He's better known to history now as the Great Captain. The Great Captain had been a Spanish soldier during the Reconquista. And Spain had come out of the Reconquista looking very good. They had reconquered the Iberian Peninsula. They had conquered the Kingdom of Granada. They thought they had a good army. But what their defeat at the hands of the French taught them is that they really didn't have a very good army. The reconquest armies of Spain were not good. Spain did not come out of the reconquest as a, a preeminent military power. Instead, what they saw is all the flaws in their battle systems. And this man took what he learned at the battlefield uh, of, 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 um, of Seminara and he applied it to retraining his soldiers. And he believed the key to success. Now, firearms had existed in Europe for several hundred years at this point, but they had not been properly employed. What he saw was that the first group that could master these firearms and combine them with pikemen would rule the battlefield. So he took his pikemen, which were a very small group compared to the pikemen of France, and he combined them with men that, that fired arquebuses or, or the, these um, handguns and, and, and people who carried swords. And this mixed unit, he called it a colonel, colunella or a column. And he thought this unit would be perfect to fight against the French Gendy arms, these heavy French cavalry, because he figured that the pikes would prevent the cavalry from charging them, and then their firearms would allow them to win the day. He proved right and correct in his assumption eight years later at the Battle of Gargliano. In the Second Italian War, Spain contested France for control of Naples. During this battle... The French continuously charged um, Cordoba's uh, colonelas units, and the result was disastrous. 8,000 French soldiers were killed at the cost of 900 Spanish lives. It was a huge victory for Spain, who had up had been that point had not been a major political power in Europe, and it proved very clearly that infantry triumphs over cavalry. Now, this image you see of the Battle of Gargliano shows how they could easily use their um, infantry to the greatest advantage. As shown here, the Spanish literally set up on the far side of a bridge and allowed the, the French to charge against them, uh, which allowed them to concentrate the French forces into a very small area, and the infantry were able to, to um, destroy them really bad. Out of this column that Cordoba made came the term Tercio. Tercio, and, and I'm probably, I'm going to butcher a whole bunch of Spanish words, so bear with me. Um, the Tercio just means thirds in Spanish. And ideally, what a Tercio was, was a unit consisting of a third pikeman, a third sword and bucklerman, and a third arquebuser. Later, even though they continued to use the word tercio, there would only be pikemen and arquebusers in there. What happened is the sword and buckler man um, and the arquebuser kind of 
merge together. And you've actually seen this before. I guarantee all of you have seen this before because the most famous unit that you've seen in all the movies that, that matches this description is the three musketeers, right? Three musketeers that they, 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 they're supposedly using guns, right? But they spend a lot of time with their swords fighting. Well, that's the merging of these two units a little later on. We'll get into that in a bit, but these units were deployed in bastion squares. So like you see in this image here, so the pikemen are in the middle uh, surrounded by the swordsmen who protect the pikemen. And then on the, these wings, the, these four square wings are all the gunners. And what happens is, it, it, as that unit marches along, the gunners out in those squares shoot everything they possibly can, right? They just knock down the other, the other forces. But if they are threatened at all by horsemen or pikemen or people charge them, they push into the middle of that square and the pikemen come out to the the exterior to keep them from being charged. Okay. So let, let's look at each one of these units in, in, in a minute, but uh, typically these tercios um, that you see were about a thousand to 2000 men strong. And, and the goal of these tercios was always to maneuver into a position where the gunmen could shoot the enemy. And then the pikemen would counter any cavalry with the push of pike. Push of pike is, is what you see here which is literally that if horsemen are coming up to you, the pikes come down um, and you hold the line and you just kind of keep your gunners protected while they continue to blast away at whatever forces is going near. It's focus, It's a defensive strategy. You, don't, you can't maneuver these big units into uh, very quickly attacking the enemy. Instead, you have to almost convince the enemy to attack you. You have to wear them down to the point where they'll commit to battle for whatever reason. So you have to have uh, th the problems with that, of course, is that you have to have a lot of money because these forces can have to spend sometimes months or years in the fields until they're maneuvered into a position where they can actually do it. But that's exactly what the, Sp the Spanish did. So they rarely committed to battles with the Tercio unless the conditions favored their units. Um, so in, in times of war during this time period of pike and shot, a lot of times people would be at war for years and they wouldn't fight any major battles because the Tercio would literally sit out on the battlefield or be moved, maneuvered around the countryside and nobody would do battle with it. And similarly, the Spanish didn't engage their enemies unless they were sure they could win. But the, the reality of the, the unit was that it was unstoppable throughout the 1500s. To look at these units in 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 in, in some greater detail, I, I want to talk about what the three composition parts of the Tercio are, and kind of what they had. Um, the arquebuser um, pictured here. This is actually a, a Dutch arquebuser, I believe, based on the picture, but it's the same idea. Uh, these are your matchlock musketeers. They carry a seventy to ninety caliber firearm. Um, that's roughly equivalent to your ten gauge shotgun nowadays. Um, it required a lit match and it kind of goes inside the barrel and shoots out. We have a great example of, of what one of these matchlock muskets look like inside the Coronado Museum. And they were also equipped with a broadsword, which you can see that on that man's hip, especially later on. Um, they're often deployed without armor because they're not meant to go into the heat of battle, but they often could wear like a metal helmet or perhaps even a cloth leather, leather or metal chest. Um, so they could wear small amounts of armor, but they were not heavily armored. Um, and they, they were slow moving, inaccurate, but had devastating missile fire, could easily shoot into ranks of, of, of formed pikemen and cavalry, but they were very vulnerable. Um, the unit to protect them was, of course, the pikemen. Uh, these are sometimes known in German sources as the Landschnick or the Swiss infantry. Um, they're armed with a pike approximately 10 to 25 feet in length. Um, and often carry a broadsword too. You can see this guy has a sword on his hip. Um, they fight in tightly knit ranks. Um, in the front ranks of these pikemen, not all the ranks, but the front ranks usually had heavy armor. So the guys that were most likely to, to get hurt uh, wore armor, especially these huge metal chest plates like this guy's wearing here. Um, uh, once again, they're slow moving. They're vulnerable to missile fire, but they're very effective against cavalry. And the last unit was the sword and buckler men. These don't last long in the history of the Tercio, um, but originally these are rodoleros or espadachines, um, later swashbucklers. 
Uh, in fact, the Spanish and the, and the French uh, eventually really liked the use of swords, but many Protestant countries, especially uh, portions of Germany and, and, and the Netherlands, did not use sword and buckler men at all. Instead, they used halberdiers, uh, men uh, with this large axe that they would carry. And other, other, other areas actually even used um, sometimes two-handed swords instead of these, these, these swords and, and shields that you see here. Um, initially, these guys are armored. They have a broad sword. Later, it's a rapier. And even much later, at the very end of this time period, they've really transitioned into that exquisite sword play that you see in all the Three Musketeer movies. Um, it, it, in fact, um, nobility would duel with these, these, these rapiers. So, so in essence, the nobility is um, mimicking the role that these gentlemen played inside the Tercio. Um, they're very fast moving. They can be skirmishers, but they, they, they can't stand against cavalry. But they were awesome against like pikemen and things like that. They can get in there and, and get out and do some damage. Um, so very interesting. So these are the three parts of the Tercio. Or Terci yeah. Um, so let's look at some examples of the, the Tercio success. Uh, first, just to give you an idea, just to how badly the French lost. I, I mentioned the first of those victories, but it only gets worse for the French from there. Um, the, the Italian war of, of 1521 to 1526, if you're asking how many Italian wars there are, there's a lot of Italian wars. In fact, I have a whole presentation where all I do is talk about all the Italian wars. Um, in, in fact, I, I'll take a minute here. If you're wondering how the Italian wars uh, relate to everything else in history, it's important to note the Italian wars are the end of the Renaissance. So, you kind of get this narrative, especially in high school, that as you come out of the Middle Ages, um, Italy's fluorescing, right? But they don't really explain how that stops. You know, Italy's going through this great, beautiful time period, and, and then the modern world starts, right? Well, the, the reality is the modern world comes to Italy, and it destroys it. It crushes every little state in Italy. It, 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 it. They all the the beautiful art they have. So there's beautiful statues made of bronze. They're melted down into cannons. And the Italian groups, the different Italian states, kill each other in the names of France and Spain. But one of the biggest battles of the Italian War was the Battle of Pavia. This battle was fought in 1525. So we're in the still the first 25 years of this era. And in this battle, the the Spanish and German forces were able to get a huge victory over the French. In, in, in a horrible display of, of the French completely ignoring the fact that, that warfare is changing. Their army of heavy horse and, and pikemen go, go meandering off at Pavia and are surrounded by the, the Spanish and German forces trained in the proper use of gun uh, uh, firearms and protecting those who have the firearms from being hurt. And the French lose about 15,000 people on the battlefield to the cost of only 500 Spanish and German lives. In fact, the king of France is actually captured in the battlefield, along with most of the nobility. So France is pretty much out of the picture for a while. In fact, we're going to tuck France away. Of course, Spain's other big enemy at the time was the Ottoman Turks. It'd be nice to say the Ottomans put up a greater fight, and of course they did um, because they were themselves modernizing at the time. But nothing could stand to the Tercio. And a perfect example of this is the conquest of Tunis in 1535. So we're talking 10 years later. Um, the Spanish begin with a naval bombardment. But eventually what they do is they send the Tercios in and the Tercios carry the day. And Tunis is, um, Tunis is captured. In fact, um, they kill so many Muslims in Tunis um, that they have to actually leave the city because it's not healthy to be there anymore. And in fact, Charles uh, goes back to Rome because at this point he's one of the victors of the Italian wars. And he goes in and in, in, in actually enters Rome as a Caesar would and uh, holds a neoclassical triumph in his, his honor. Uh, in France and Turkey, or the Ottomans, I shouldn't say Turkey, they're not, the Ottoman Empire is not Turkey. Um, they're, they're related, but they're not the same. Uh, but the French and Turks decide um, the only way they're ever going to beat Spain is to team up. But even that doesn't work. And in deciding a, a Ottoman ex expansion, um, 
perhaps even a more impressive victory, perhaps one of the greatest battles ever fought. The Battle of Lepanto uh, was fought on October 7th, 1571. This was a battle literally where the Ottoman Empire and the Spanish Empire met at sea, linked their ships together, and fought a ground war at, in, in the ocean. The Turks lost 20,000. Uh, to the Spanish seventy five thousand, and while this wasn't a, a, a you know this wasn't a normal uh, tercio battle, it saw Spain's best go up against Turkey's best or the Ottomans best, the elite Janissary corps, and a uh, triumph once again. Um, I don't know if it's one of my w- what I would view as the most important battles in history, but certainly it's it 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 it, it must have been a sight to behold. And in fact, I will not be able to say it right. But if you want to Google it later on, there was actually a guy there. And I'm not going to remember who exactly was off the top of my head. But um, one gentleman uh, on the, the um, Spanish side from Venice. Um, but I, he um, got his hand chopped off and, and put a chicken on it, like a chicken body on it, and then went on fighting. And that's like something that really happened. Talk about strange things in history. And of course, I'm not saying that right, right now. But it's just one of those weird things that sticks in my brain about that battle. Uh, uh, Miguel Cervantes was actually at the battle as well. Um, though I don't think he was the one who put the chicken on his hand. For 100 years, from 1495, the loss in 1495, you know, in, in the, the subsequent battle in, in, in 1503, I think is what I, I listed there from about 1503 to 1600 Spain was at the top of its game and the first real loss for Spain didn't come till almost 100 years later in 1600 when in the battle of Newport where the Dutch were fighting for their independence against the Spanish um, the Spanish lost about 2500 to the Dutch and English as combined 2000 so that's a nominal Dutch in English victory and it, it did take Spain by surprise to lose from, uh, from this standpoint. But this wasn't the end of Spanish power. What the Dutch had done is brought about some new techniques that were added to the battlefield. Remember, the Dutch at this point, these are, it, it might be better to refer to the Dutch because these are the Spanish Netherlands we're talking about, um, the, 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 um, the areas that Spain wanted to control, but that were eventually going to gain their freedom. Um, these these rebellious Spanish subjects took the tercio and changed it up a bit. And these changes were undergone by a man by the name of Maurice of Nassau. Um, he, he's, he's mainly remembered, it's a title, he, he's mostly known by his title, which was the Prince of Orange. He was the Prince of Orange uh, between 1618 and 1625. Um, he's, he's very much a Dutch hero of the 80 years war, which was the war for Dutch independence and 30 years war, which we'll be coming to in a minute. Um, and pretty much what he realized, which was going to come true for everybody other than Spain, is that he understood that he didn't have the manpower or the wealth of Spain to field these large, heavily armored armies. He could not deploy a whole bunch of tercios in the battlefield. So instead, he says, well, let's take the, the, the concept of the tercio and let's make it smaller. Let's make it more flexible. And Dutch military doctrine is really what, if you go to a bookstore today and you want to learn about the era of pike and shot and you want to buy a, a manual from the time period, chances are you're going to get an English or Dutch or Protestant military manual. What the Dutch did is, first of all, they standardized and codified everything. So the size of your pike was completely, none of it was random. No tur- no group could have a, a, a different pike size. Every unit would have the same pike size. Every unit would have the same caliber of, of arquebus. And every unit would drill exactly the same way. There would be n- and nothing but uniformity. And these units, rather than being 1,000 to 2,000 men, were 550 men. And specifically, there were to be 250 pikes and 300 guns. And the idea of this, you know, they're still in a Renaissance way of thinking. The Dutch are looking to uh, Rome, the ancient Roman Empire, and they believe that these units are based upon or inspired by the Roman cohort. And in this kind of way of fighting, this standardized way of fighting, 
quickly sweeps Locke across all Protestant armies in the world. So England and Sweden in particular. We'll come back to Sweden a lot more in, in a few minutes. But they drilled like nobody's business. They built manuals, exactly how you're supposed to deploy your men. And, and in fact, you can see here, this is a uh, manual uh, from an English battle manual. And on the left, you can see how the unit's supposed to 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 be positioned so everybody knows where they're supposed to be in the rank and file how the 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 men are supposed to be deployed and then on the right hand side you'll see a guy who's holding a gun now he's not telling you how to shoot the gun all those pictures are just how to attach the match to your gun safely and they and just think there's books with pages after pages of exactly what you do from every step you could possibly imagine uh, forward and they would drill and drill and drill until every Dutch soldier could do everything in exactly the same motion at exactly the same time. Did it help them? No, it did not. Um, now I said Spain had kind of lost that battle, that small battle. They came right back. And at the siege of Breda uh, between 1624 and 1625, the Spanish waited outside the city and then when, when the, 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 the Dutch and English kept trying to break the siege, the Spanish, the Tercios, which were in place, just stayed put and were able to bring them to their knees. The, the siege cost the Dutch and English about 10,000 to the cost of uh, 4,000 Spanish. Now, mind you, they did lose at a better rate than most other nations did it against Spain at that time, but they still lost handedly and were, were forced to surrender. In fact, it looked at the time at the Siege of Breda that Dutch independence was not going to happen. Um, the, um, the, 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 the Spanish just had too much power. They could wait out the Dutch. So the Dutch could potentially, if they could get these, the, their armies moving on the battlefield, you know, out in the field, they could possibly do some good. It didn't happen. They, 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 they failed wholeheartedly. And in fact, if you'll notice my list of wars this is associated with, I say the it says Anglo-Spanish War, 80 Years War, and the 30 Years War, which is the next thing we have to talk about. The 30 Years War is what actually came to define to the era of Pike and Shot. That war, uh, which I, I don't want to talk too much about, but I do want to briefly bring up uh, for this talk, uh, was waged between 1618 and 1648, about so 30 years. Um Interestingly enough, if you were to, to study the Thirty Years' War, it's one of the most bizarre wars that, that, that ever occurred from a standpoint of trying to get a narrative as to why it was fought and what happened in it. Um, the best way I can describe it to you in a, a single slide is to say it started as a war between Catholics and Protestants in Germany and then eventually turned into a dynastic battle between the French Bourbon dynasty and the Spanish-German Habsburg dynasty. More than 8 million people died in this war, which depopulated most of, of what we would call today Germany. Um, now, the French and Spanish portion of the war, the, the last part of the war, does run concurrent with the English civil wars. And, 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 and the, war, the war itself ends with a couple important things. First of all, the recognition of the Dutch Republic. So the, the Netherlands becomes a nation, a real nation. Um, the second thing that the, the Thirty Years' War does is it protects the rights of Protestants to worship freely. So, pro so this sounds weird. France helps the Protestants worship freely. And then lastly, it makes sure that the Habsburgs cannot unify Germany. And they never do, J just to be clear. Germany will become unified, but it will not be under the Holy Roman Empire. It will be under the Kingdom of Prussia that Germany unifies. And that's an important step because... It, the Germany will not, even though perhaps in the 15 and 1600s, Germany was moving towards unification, it would not happen until the 19th century. Um, so th th this is something that would be delayed by hundreds of years as a result of these wars. Okay. But when I talk about the 30 years war, what I want you to remember is this figure here. So if Cordoba established modern warfare, and, and, and Maurice of Nassau kind of kind of modified the, the Spanish ideas or at least brought some alternative ideas to the battlefield. The guy who defined the alternative battle movement uh, to Spain was a, was a, a, a very important Swedish king, a, a man we know today as Gustavus Adolphus. 
King Gustav II, Adolf, the Lion of the North, or Gustav the Great, was the king of Sweden in a time period when Sweden was actually an empire. Um, he was part of the House of Vasa, which I, I don't want to talk about too much, but as you can probably imagine, as my slide says there, it was also the house that ruled Poland and, 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 and parts of Russia at different time periods. Um, it, it's a very important uh, noble family in the history of Europe during the early modern era, but pretty much um, he was the hero of the 30 years war was one of the heroes of the 30 years war, but he actually spent most of his career fighting Poland. Now I am going to put one slide about Poland in here because I have to. Um, the other side of the Vasa family controlled the Polish Lithuanian Commonwealth. Now this is not Poland per se as today. I, I gave a talk about the early Polish state. This is not the early Polish state. The early Polish state was centered in Poland. The Polish Lithuanian Commonwealth would perhaps be best understood as those areas which make up the modern day states of Belarus and Ukraine. It did include portions of modern day Poland, but it was not really centered in Poland. Um, its capital though was Warsaw, interestingly enough, but the Polish army was very different from the Spanish army. So who, who Gustavus Adolphus was fighting in the, 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 the early years of his career were the, these Polish armies, which were primarily made up of these, these cavalry, these uh, Hussar and Panserini and their, and marauders or Hadouk. Um, but they also had, interestingly enough, the Polish army of this era had large numbers of Ukrainian Cossacks in it. And the Cossacks were very interesting because while they, they lived on the very frontiers of the steppe in, in what we would call uh, eastern or central, southern, so, south central, uh, southeastern Ukraine today, um, they were interesting in that they rode horses to the battlefield but dismounted for combat. Now, Gustavus wasn't very, uh, he, he didn't win a lot of battles against the Poles. So even though he ends up winning some fantastic victories, it's not going to be against Poland. Uh, in fact, in the Polish-Swedish War um, in, in, in June 25th of 1629, uh, the Poles in, in Germans, uh, uh, and by Germans in this case, I mean Prussians, uh, win in a, an amazing battle against the Swedes, um, which 800 Swedes are killed versus about 200 allies. And what happens in the battle is uh, Gustavus Adolphus um, almost dies twice in the battle. And, and what he realizes how fast the Polish army, um, and I'm, I'm using that term loosely here, obviously, the Polish army can deploy on the battlefield. A second, they're not there. And then the next second, they've got huge battle arrays set up in front of them in different areas that he thought he was going to be able to move through. This was because they used horses to such great advantage. And a lot of this is credit not just to the Polish cavalry, but the Ukrainian Cossacks, which showed that you could easily, that if, if properly deployed, horse, people riding horses with guns were very effective. As a result of these battles with the Poles, Gustavus Adolphus redoes his entire army, leading to a small time period, which is often called the era of shot in horse. He takes the Swedish army and he re-emphasizes the role of cavalry. And, and so that the cavalry is going to be, um, is going to run in with gunmen firing in support of the charge. So the charge is going to come back onto the battlefield. More importantly, he trains his infantry to ride horses so that they can quickly deploy. And he deploys them, and instead of those square blocks that you saw the Spanish Tercio uses, he uses what is often known as linear uh, battle arrays or linear formations. He also has his troops fire three ranks deep. So if you look at that lower photograph where you see there's one set of guys firing on their knee, one guy, cr one set crouching down, and then a third set standing up behind them, all firing at once. He's able to make it a tremendous amount of lead shot go downfield very, very quickly. Remember, these guys are all potentially, and he can't do this with all his units, but he, he tries as many of them as he can to get them on horseback. These are your first units of dragoons, infantry that deploys on horseback. We can see his successes at the Battle of Brighton Field, uh, which is, is, is certainly ingrained in, in Swedish 
uh, culture today. Uh, that battle was fought in 1631. It was an amazing Protestant victory in which Gustavus Adolphus um, was able to make some amazing charges. He destroyed the Catholics at Brighton failed. Remember, he is the head of the Protestant armies in, in Germany at this time period. He wins a stunning victory, um, you know, killing many more than he, he doesn't. The de his deployment strategies, his mobility, his volley fire, it all proves decisive, and he wins in a tremendous victory. So, of course, Gustavus Adolphus wins the Thirty Years' War, right? No, no, he doesn't. Um, but the um, like Cordoba, he's often cited as the father of modern warfare. Um, his strategies help to redefine what Protestant armies are going to look like in the future. And, and as far as historical figures go, it's important to note that Oliver Cromwell, Napoleon Bonaparte, Karl von Clausewitz all studied Gustavus and cite him as their military inspiration. So he is a very important figure. However, he dies. He dies at the Battle of Lutzen in 1632, uh, leading a charge. Um, he, he, he manages to win the battle, but it ends up being an indecisive battle, and he's just barely able to pull it out. And what happens is the way it was going to go from the start, as far as the Spanish were concerned. They wore them down, and several years later, two years later at the Battle of Nordlingen, the Tercios were deployed, and Spain came to victory. So much of a victory, in fact, and this, this, was, this battle pretty much brought uh, the Habsburg Empire into ascendancy. 12,000 Protestants were killed and captured at the cost of about 2,400 Catholics. Um, the, 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 the Spanish brought in their finest tercios uh, from Spain and Italy into Germany, and they just mopped the floor with them. In fact, the Protestants give up. It should be noted that in the Thirty Years' War, the Tercio has, has shown its dominance, even with all these different changes by the Protestant armies, the Tercio is dominant. And the Protestants decide to surrender. The Protestant leaders signed the Treaty of Prague with Emperor Ferdinand II in 1635. Under the treaty, German princes are not allowed to form independent armies, which in essence means that only the Habsburgs can have an army. Um, instead, the, the princes have to, their armies go into the Habsburg army. Uh, and, and this is viewed as potentially the realization of the Counter-Reformation. Pretty much there aren't going to be any Protestants in a few years. Um, Protestant nobility can't vote. Protestant nobility and priests can't vote in the imperial diet, which is, in essence means that only a Catholic emperor is going to rule Germany for the, the, the future. Um the Dutch independence is off the table. Um, nothing's going to happen. The, the, and eventually what's going to happen potentially is Spain and, and, and the Holy Roman Empire once again, again, going to reunite, which that includes, to be clear, what that includes, that includes all the Iberian Peninsula at this point. All, so Portugal, Spain, you name it, most of Italy, um, most of, uh, of what is today Germany, and they're, they're best friends with the Poles, the, the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth. So all of Eastern, pretty much at this point, um, the Polish-Lithuanian co um, Commonwealth goes all the way to Moscow. So this gigantic uh, Polish Catholic state is their best buddies. And the only people who would be left hanging around in the middle of this whole mess would be the French. So what do the French do? They need to solve this problem. Remember, they'd gotten themselves into this problem in the first place. And so we're going to end with discussing the French and how the French discover how to beat the Spanish Tercio. Now, during this whole time period I've been talking about, the French have been going through their own religious wars, right? Protestants versus Catholics. French have been killing each other. Um, and, and, and France has long supported anybody who hates Spain in, in Germany or in the Habsburg empire. So they, they're, they're allies of the Protestants. They're allies of Orthodox Christians in Russia. They're allies of the Muslims. They're, they're one of the biggest supporters of, of Ottoman, the Ottoman Turks. Um, anything to get over on uh, the Habsburg empire and their allies, pretty much the Polish Lithuanian Commonwealth in Venice where they're two big allies. When the Protestants fail to win the Thirty Years' War, France enters the war on the side of the Protestants. 
under a man known as Cardinal, Cardinal Richelieu. Now, if you want, read three Musketeers novels, you'll know that Cardinal Richelieu is usually looked at as the bad guy. That's not really true. As far as a, a politician for France, he was everything France needed at the time period. He, even though he's ideally a, a Catholic um, priest, he's uh, realistically, he, he, he understands that th there's just no way Spain and, and, and the Habsburgs can win. So he declares war on Spain in 1635 and the Holy Roman Empire in 1636 to continue the war. He encourages Protestants, Swedes, and Germans to continue to revolt for religious freedom uh, in, in, in the Holy Roman Empire. But he also finances uh, Portuguese and Catalonian, um, uh, Catalan um, uh, independence. So uh, the people of Barcelona and the people of Lisbon were encouraged to revolt and seek their own independence from Spain, uh, which... As we learned in some of the other talks, Portuguese do get their own independence, though uh, the Catalans today still do not have their independence from Spain. So it's, it's still a portion of Spain today. But he, he encouraged all of this. And what France had the ability to do that none of these Protestant nations really had is they had the money and willpower to wear down the Habsburgs. So the Imperials continue, the, the Tercios continue to win battle after battle, but attrition is setting in. The Tercios cannot fight all of Europe. And by 1640, the, the Habsburg Empire which in, in, of Spain, Italy, and, and Austria had been at war for 22 years and is suffering from not only the war, but revolts and uh from Protestant princes and their own Catholic subjects. They're getting worn down. And the end of this, well, the, the, the beginning of the end for them comes in 1643. The French managed to corner the Tercios on open ground and they just lay into them. Using the ideas pioneered by Adolphus Gustavus with a larger battle army, were able to just run in charge after charge after charge. And then they're not charging the pikemen. They're riding right up to the edge of the pikemen and they're firing their guns at point blank range and then retreating out and coming back and firing their guns at point blank range. And while it's not a, an amazing victory for the French by any means, it was a startling victory with 7,000 Spaniards dying on the battlefield to 4,000 French. But the most important thing is the Tercio had that several of the Tercios that were deployed in the battlefield had to surrender. They could no longer take losses. They couldn't retreat. They were beaten. The same year, a young man would come to rule France. His name um, is Louis um, often known as, as Louis the Great, Louis the Fourteenth, or the Sun King. You can see him here in his most regal attire. Louis was perhaps the greatest king Europe had ever seen. And I don't mean great as in he was a very good dude. He wasn't a very good dude. But he was a megalomaniac, crazy king who believed in his own hype to the greatest extent possible. And he realized that the world... And, and everything else, just like the sun, everything would revolve around him. Uh, he's also one of the longest reigning monarchs. Um, uh, and he looked at himself as being appointed by God. He was an absolute monarch. Uh, he oversaw the expansion of, of France uh, over a long different, uh, a large area, you know, colonizing in the new world. But he also managed to do something that, that the French kings and the legacy of which is still with us today, even though the Berber, Ber, uh, Ber, the Bourbon dynasty is no longer rules France. It's important to note the King of Spain is a descendant of Louis the 14th. He not only managed to win France, but he managed to put people in his bloodline on the throne of Spain. He put his own grandson on the throne of Spain at the end of his life. And perhaps most notably for this, um, this this presentation is he said, I loved war too much. That's what his, his takeaway was. Now, he fought a lot of wars. I'm not going to talk about any of these wars. You can look at them here. If it looks like there's a lot, a lot of wars, yeah, there were. In fact, 
you you've seen the three musketeer movies those are all glorifying the the eras of of, of louis the 14th in fact even if you watch beauty and the beast the disney movie it's glorifying the era in which louis the 14th was king of france you just keep that in mind um most of many of the most famous military minds to come out of 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 of, of the modern age were louis generals this includes louis de bourbon uh the grand count um, who defeated the Spanish at Rockroy. He was um, related to Louis. We have uh, Turenne, a uh, field marshal that reformed the French cavalry and won the Battle of the Dunes. We have um, Vauban, who pretty much created the star fort and was the one uh, pivotal to developing the socket bayonet and so on and so forth. All France comes back with a vengeance. And they really bring some of their own military innovation to the table. Uh, first of all, they split the difference. So they take the Tercio and they take the Dutch battalion and they split it in terms of size and they create their own units, the regiment, which we you probably know that the regiment is a term we still use today. Um, they develop flintlock muskets. They're, they're adopted in France, developed in France in 1610 and adopted by the mid 1600s. So the musket comes about. I, the name musketeer and they figure out a way that mind you at this point the, the swordsmen are gone right but so you have a, a gunner who carries a sword and a pikeman who carries a sword you don't have a specific swordsman but what if the gunner could carry his own pike and that's what they developed they developed the bayonet uh the bayonet allows the 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 hand gunner to be in addition to the gunner the pikeman so it allows gunners to stand against the cavalry without support of pikes. And, and a great example of the French ingenuity is the Battle of Marsaglia in, in 1693. This was part of the War of the Grand Alliance in which French uh, had an amazing victory against Savoy in Spain. Um, about 10,000 Allied dead versus about 1,800 French. And, and the French pretty much show them because they're all standing around the battlefield and the gunners all of a sudden put on a, uh, put their bayonets on their guns and charge the enemy lines. And this is one of the first times that's happened is a bayonet charge. And the bayonet charge proves light years above what people were thinking of until that point. Um, Louis didn't win all of his wars, but the interesting thing about Louis is that even when he didn't win, he won. Um, so in, in several cases, he lost wars and you think, well, that means he didn't get his way right No, He still got his way. He was just, he was one of those people, but I want to end with some conclusions here about this era, because I, I've, I brought you up from a time period where pikemen were very important and they were teamed up with gunners to the fact that where gunners now have bayonets and now we're getting into a different time period. So the era of pike and shot was a time period in which Spain ruled the battlefield with his nearly invincible tercios. Dutch and Swedish leaders brought some new innovations and reforms to warfare, but lacked the wealth and manpower to successfully overcome the, the, the Spanish. The people who actually figured out how to beat the Spanish Tercia were the French, because they took all those reforms that the, the Dutch and Swedes had made, and they combined it with new technological advancements and were finally able to decisively beat the Spanish and become the preeminent power in Europe. In fact, when you start talking about the history of the 1700s, which is where our story ends, you'd be talking once again like the start of our story in the sense that it starts with the French are the most powerful and biggest army uh, Europe has ever seen. With that, I'm, I, I'm probably over on my time, but I will answer a couple questions and comments. You can email me too as well, and I'm, I'm more than happy to do that. All right. So that was a lot. I see there is something in the chat. Was Francis I the patron of Leonardo? No, I don't think he was, but I'm not entirely sure off the top of my head. That was one of somebody's questions. That was Julie's question. It, in it, I don't think he was the patron of Leonardo, um, but I, I would have to double check on that. Francis I was kind of the patron of himself, but that's, um, or the patron of, of Suleiman the Wise, I guess, if that's, that's probably getting a bit ahead of myself. Any other questions, though, about the history of Pike and Shot? I will make a comment. I, I noticed that most of the people on listening to this presentation today are women, which is atypical of a military history presentation. I'll let you guys know that right now, but I think it's great. I think it's fantastic. Um, 
Okay. So, so Sherry asked Richelieu, can you explain why he supported various sides? Um, Richelieu did not support various sides. He always supported the side of France. But one of the things the Cardinals had, and there was another Cardinal before him by the name of, um, I want to say Marzon. And I may be pronouncing those wrong. So bear with me guys. Uh, Richelieu could not, he had been funneling money to the Protestants fighting in Germany during the 30 years war up until that point. But when the Protestants no longer had to fight in them, he knew that he was not going to, um, that France would not survive if the Protestants did not win the 30 years war. So France's involvement in the 30 years war had nothing to do with their, his love of, of taking other sides, but really the reality of the fact that France could not afford to be surrounded by the Habsburgs on both sides, at least in a powerful state. So um, he intentionally went into it. Now, it's important to note that the French history is more complicated than that. So it should be important to note that the Cardinal Richelieu and Cardinal Marzon were both cardinals for the Bourbon dynasty. The Bourbon dynasty had come to power during the wars um, between Catholics and Protestants in France. Um, I might have said this before in other lectures, but if you don't know, the Protestants won in France. So the Protestants came to power in France. However, the Bourbon Protestants, to, to claim the kingship of France in the War of Three Henrys, they had to convert to Catholicism. So in the Protestants winning the religious wars in France, they converted to Catholicism. Does that make sense? That's pretty weird, I know, to say the Protestants won and as a result, they converted to Catholicism, but that's exactly what happened in France. So that's where um, that, that necessarily comes from. And I, I know that is very, very strange and I cannot explain French history. I can only push you in the right direction towards understanding it. In fact, most of the greatest stories about French history, as far as I'm concerned, come from Louis the 14th and anybody interested in French history really should study Louis the 14th, not just as a, a, a man who fought many wars or more, I should say wars were fought on his behalf, but, but also as a man who, who, who represented the height of and I, I'm not a big fan of kingship in general, but if you're going to go crazy and say that you have a divine right to rule, then you can't get any more egotistical than Henry and or Louis. I'm sorry, Louis the Fourteenth, and Louis. Just if you want to see everything wrong with nobility, you'll see it in him. But then you also see the the powers and uses of it. Now, Medi asked, um, yeah. Yes. So uh, Julie said, is it one of the Henry's, the ones who said Paris is worth the mass? Yes. That's Henry Bourbon, the first Bourbon King who converted to Catholicism. That is supposedly what he said. That's not to say that's actually what he said. In fact, I, I, I'm not sure it's not a misquote of some sort, but it's become popular in our culture to say that. Now, there are some other questions there, so I, I, I do want to address those because we could probably talk about the Bourbon dynasty, and I'm not the most knowledgeable about the Bourbon dynasty. In fact, I would tell a story, and I've told this story before, and probably have some, perhaps I've said it here, a, a story about how the chef had to kill himself because he couldn't feed everybody at, at, at Louis' court. Uh, that's a great story. And if you want to look up a story about Louis and ask about the food at his court, you'll probably find that story in the internet. It's a glorious story, but really not relevant to what I'm talking about here. Now, I do have two other questions, uh, one of which is, does the term swashbuckler come from sword and buckler? Yes. Yeah, pretty much. It, it does. Um, the swashbuckling rogue, it all comes from that sword and buckler. And what it really is in, in a more complicated form is there was a type of sword play coming out of the Renaissance. The Spanish took it up and, and over time it was made more elaborate. Originally it was with a sword and a shield. Then it becomes with like a sword and a dagger. And then eventually it just becomes the, the dueling that you see today as fencing. Um, is that kind of a fighting style. It doesn't really come out of the medieval knight tactics per se. It comes out of uh, a, a sword play that develops in Italy and then kind of spreads across the area. But the way you know it most likely is seeing probably as a kid, three musketeer movies. So that's probably the best way for me to explain it. Even though those movies are not necessarily historical accurate, though there was a person by the name of D'Artagnan in Louis XIV's army, in the musketeers. 
um, which was a special force in Louis XIV's army. He had lots of special forces because he, he loved that idea. But once again, I'm going to stop on Louis XIV for now. Um, uh, there's another question that says, does this explain why the Swedish language has more French influence than Danish and Norwegian? I don't know the answer to that. Uh, my guess would be somewhat yes, because the the Swedes at this point, it, it, in Denmark, it had an empire earlier in history, and the Danish empire w- was certainly, and I'm not, not discrediting the Danes in any way, nor am I, my, am I discouraging of Norway or even Finland. But at the time of the early modern era, the most powerful uh, Nordic country, and perhaps the most powerful, certainly the most powerful Protestant country for several years, was Sweden. And it, it, it's weird because the Swedish family, the Vasa family, uh, which came to rule Sweden, was also invited or uh, invited, elected to rule the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth. So the same family had two branches, one of which became staunch Protestants and the other became staunch Catholics. So one is responsible for the highly Catholic nature of, of Poland today. And the other one is, it, well, maybe not just responsible for, but, but contributed to the crazy, not, not crazy, the, the radical forms of Catholicism you sometimes see in Poland today, whereas the other group um, was, was very much in, in favor of the Lutheran church and how those two branches break off and then m- spend most of their money and time killing each other is very interesting. All these people, the Swedes and Poles die because this family can't get along or decide how God should be worshiped. But that being said, because Sweden was such a large, uh, not only military empire, but commercial empire in the early modern era, it would not surprise me if that's how many French words or French influence got into Sweden as a whole. But I don't know that that's not really, um, Sweden itself is not my strong point. Um, per se so that, that that may or may not have, have answered the questions okay since i have one more minute i'm gonna tell you guys a story about louis and the chef anyways because and i'll probably say it wrong but then you can look it up on the internet afterwards and you can tell me that i'm off a little bit but it's the most bizarre story i've ever heard and it's one of my favorite stories about the early modern era um so as as it were um louis had so louis had um oh god the big courtyard outside of paris built uh i think it's versailles bear with me if it's not versailles um he builds there and he has all the nobility come and visit him and his parties are elaborate right they're, they're this amazing fair and you get to eat all sorts of food the, the chef's preparing a meal for the night or one of the nights of this multi-night celebration louis doing and um the, he gets through you know he's feeding all these nobles but he never knows how many people are going to come and he runs out of food and he's ashamed by it. So the next day he tells his staff, he's like, we can't have that happen again, right? I need you go buy, and I'm going to create an elaborate fish dish for this next night. I need you to go get all the fish. Um, and, and the guy, the, one of his servants comes back and tells him that they're, 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 he was only able to get this much. He was only able to get this much fish or whatnot. And the chef rather than suffering the humiliation of not being able to finish and complete his course, uh, falls on his own knife to save himself the humiliation of, of having to have to go to Louis and tell him that he could not have his fancy dinner that night. Pretty bizarre that you would die just not to upset Louis, but that's kind of how Louis was. Uh, In fact, uh, a more realistic thing is the reason he's inviting all these nobles to his his palace at Versailles is because he didn't want them out in the countryside. Louis felt the best way to control France was to have fewer nobles or give the nobles nothing to do other than entertain themselves. So he pretty much paid to have these personal parties for the nobles so that he could put people he trusted out in the countryside working for him. And so the soldiers were loyal not to the noble that lived in that area, but to Louis. Um, it's the, almost the opposite of feudalism, where in feudalism, the king's very weak. Rather, you have a, a system of alliances that eventually go up to the king. Louis made it so that everybody owed their existence to Louis. And he was very good at that. He was a very dynamic ruler in the sense that he actually is, in essence, the absolute monarch that we expect When the king's word means the king's word. The reality is in medieval kingdoms, the king's word didn't mean crap because the reality is the king could say something, but you'd never see the king. 
Um, and if the noble, your local noble didn't enforce what the king said, you didn't have to worry about it. But Louis, whatever he said, went everywhere because your position was tied to Louis being happy. Your position, everything. Now, not just, uh, not just the noble, but even the cook. It was, it was dependent upon him. So that's just a different way of looking at life. And, and perhaps if, if you're interested in things like that, I wouldn't glamorize him, but if, if, if you're interested in things like that, he's a good figure to learn about. But that being said, we are out of time. And I thank you all for your, your time today. And hopefully you learned a little bit. Next time I will actually be flipping the coin and I will be talking about the history of the three Islamic states, which rise to power during this time. And instead of it being a military history, like this presentation is today, we will be talking primarily about what cultural aspects make those kingdoms great. And those kingdoms are the Ottoman Turks in the West, the Safavid Persians in the, the center, in the, in the, on the Iranian plateau. And then lastly, Mughal India. All right. Thank you. Have a nice night guys.